truth. I'm 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 unforbidden truth. Welcome to Unforbidden Truth. I'm Andrew. Today I'll be speaking with my friend James Sparks. James is a criminologist, a professor of national and international serial homicide, and is an expert in the juvenile justice field. If you remember the interviews done with Krista Pike and Tadaryl Ship that were released shortly after Unforbidden Truth launched, that was James conducting both interviews. James has been corresponding and visiting with convicted murderers almost as long as I've been alive. James got to spend time with executed serial killer John Wayne Gacy and deceased confession killer Henry Lee Lucas. James recently published a textbook titled Case Studies of Murder, The Enigma of an American Serial Killer. Here's my interview with criminologist James Sparks. My name is James Sparks and I've worked in the criminal justice field for the past 25 years, uh, primarily focused on juvenile justice. I've also spent some time researching serial murder and I've taught a serial murder class uh, a domestic international serial killer class almost for 20 years now with a local university. Uh, during that, that time frame, of course, I used to visit with John Wayne Gacy while I was in grad school and completed my graduate thesis on him. I also visited with uh, Henry Lee Lucas or visited him prior to him being uh, taken off death row and put in general population. Uh, and then, of course, I've corresponded with hundreds of serial killers and mass murders over the past uh, 30 years. Uh, right now, I still work in the juvenile justice field and I still teach um, and still keep up to date with true crime sort of situations and cases. What made you want to get into working in the criminal justice system? Was it kind of like a, a hobby at first or like fascination turned, you know, I guess business venture turned career? Well, at first, I actually wanted to go to law school. Um, and I quickly found out that once um, I had started taking classes and um, started learning about, you know, all the historical con concepts of the criminal justice field, I learned that I really wanted to focus on juvenile justice. Um, and then I sort of, you know, sidetracked that and wanted to go to look at maybe um, focuses on serial murder and serial homicide. And what I did was um, I started doing the research there, and then I thought maybe, you know, this would be an opportunity for me to maybe apply for the FBI and do profiling or something like that. Uh, but in the end, even after doing the research, and I still do research on serial murder, even in the end, I found that I was probably best suited for the juvenile justice field overall. So your main two areas of study or places that you would want to work would involve like profiling serial murder and or juvenile justice in some capacity? Yeah, I think that's probably where I started. And then, you know, it sort of geared back to the juvenile justice. It seems like it came back around it every time just because there were a lot of interesting juvenile justice cases. And there were a lot of situations where you hear about, you know, juveniles being tried as adults. Um, and that sort of concerned me, especially whenever, you know, we're supposed to be rehabilitative in nature when we talk about the juvenile justice system. And I felt like, you know, that was something I had to be a part of. If, if I could do my part and try to help a family or help a kid, then that's what I was going to start to do. And that's just honestly the way I felt about it. That didn't stop me from doing the research with serial murder. And like I said, I still do that. I just, you know, uh, finished a textbook um, for my class and that allowed me to dive back into the research field. Um, but even today, you know, we hear about it consistently with the juvenile justice system. We constantly hear about cases that come up that are one of those ones that sort of make you think, well, what had happened? What's going on with kids and how can we do something to help them? And that's the way I've always felt. So were you in the sense to, to help the kids that are on the wrong path or that have gone on the wrong path? Well, at the time, you know, when I first started, I had generic case loads and then I started going into specialized case loads with uh, very various what they call problem solving courts, gun court, drug court, and what have you. Uh, then that's not to say that during the course of uh, while I've been a probation officer for the past 20 plus years that I haven't had to deal with uh, juvenile murderers. Uh, and that's a, a pretty big deal, you know, as far as seeing them and see what happens. And sometimes it's a lot of situations where circumstances are beyond their control or they're put into a situation um, that in the wrong place at the wrong time, 
they hook up with the wrong people and things just happen. And it's really sad to see someone basically, you know, especially where I live in this state, uh, get convicted, get well, get transferred from the juvenile system to the adult system, get convicted, and they're in prison, you know, for 20 plus years, you know, sometimes even up to life, it seems like. Have you seen any mitigating factors that pop up more than anything else when it comes to juveniles, even just guns or drugs or whatever, like you were saying, 15, 20 plus year sentences when they're, you know, 14, 15, 16 years old? I think that probably what, uh, and this is my opinion only, I think where we fail in that area is that there is not enough emphasis and focus placed on mental health and trauma of juveniles. I think that we overlook that. Um, and a lot of times the folks, people, families involved don't know what services they have to help them with certain things. And, um, it's just horrible, uh, when you start reading through mental health reports or read police reports and see what's happened. And then when you talk to the kids or when they go to court and you see all these things, you're like, oh my Lord, there are so many things that, you know, could have been done to help them. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, the way we live and the society we live in, it seems like there's a lot of punishment and not trying to make excuses for them. It just seems like we need to do everything that we can to try to help these kids so they don't become killers. So they don't become, you know, get in prison. But the underlying factor in most of these cases are broken homes, um, not enough resources, you know, poverty, um, they're not medicated when they need to be. In some instances, they're over-medicated. And then uh, a lot of these kids are dealing with trauma that they suffered years ago when they were children, and they can't break out of that. And it's just a sad situation uh, when you think about it. I was just talking to a former juvenile death row inmate the other day. He was saying, what does rehabilitation mean when there's nothing to be rehabilitated? You know, when, when guys are 14, 15 years old, going to prison, you know, joining gangs or this or that and, and doing things to, you know, to get, you know, recognition or some type of status when they don't even know what they're doing right from wrong in, in the sense that legally they do, but, you know, really they're just trying to impress somebody or, or, you know, get that like stabilization, you know, when they don't have any parents or this or that. And it's kind of sad, you know, when you need to rehabilitate somebody that's never been habilitated, I guess. Well, there's another thing, Andrew, too, that we don't think about. And we think about, you know, you can send these kids off or even young adults off and uh, they go to facilities and prisons and what have you. Uh, but the thing that seems to be overlooked is at some point they have to be released and get what, guess where they get released back to? The same place that they were where all these problems started. It's almost like, and you know, that's that, if we could solve that problem, we would have, you know, juvenile crime and even adult crime solved. But that's one of those things that it just seems like it's an ongoing issue. There's not enough programs in this country set up to sort of uh, provide programs and uh, habilitative sort of things in nature to help people progress positively. And uh, when they come out of jail and they go back to where they came from, what do you expect for some of these folks to do? They just get right back in the same scenario, hang around the same folks, and guess what's happening? You know, they're back in jail before it's over with. Sometimes they sort of get um, known by local authorities and what have you. And, you know, sometimes, and I'm not saying that happens in all cases, but, you know, you read the literature, you talk to the inmates, you've, you've asked them what's happened to them. And I probably would venture to say that time and time again, that they became known by the authorities. And every time something comes up, that's, that's where they come. They come to question them first. And, it, and it's unfortunate. And, and sometimes, you know, some of these jokers are bad news, you know, not, not every one of them, but, but sometimes you do get a few bad apples, but still you would, you would hope that at some point or some uh, measure, we could sort of provide some sort of rehabilitative nature for them. John Wayne Gacy, what was that first visit like? Well, the first visit, you know, was sort of like one of those things that I had no idea what to expect. It all started because I had watched To Catch a Killer, the uh, made-for-TV movie on WGN, where Brian Dennehy starred as John Gacy. And then after watching a news program after the last broadcast of the program, uh, they basically showed a, a response from John. And uh, at the time, I was, you know, 
just like everyone else, I had a VCR and I was taping the thing. And then I taped the after, after, new, after movie special and I was able to see his address on one of the letters that they showed. So I just freezed it and, you know, and I wrote the address down and then wrote him a letter. And, uh, you know, I got a, a response back from him and it wasn't so nice in a sense. He was like, uh, you think you know everything about my crimes, you don't have any idea. I know I, I have this proof, this proof, this proof, this proof, you know. And then, you know, he, I said, uh, okay. So I wrote him back and uh, he said, well, you know, if you want to, you can come visit. So we started going back and I think probably within the first couple letters, I think we'd had a visit set up probably about a month or two after my letters started. And what I did was before I even made a visit, you know, I was in school. I'd sort of determined that I was going to do something about as far as a paper or what have you. And uh, I was concerned. So what I did was I called the Department of Corrections, uh, the head guy in Illinois at the time, and spoke with him. Really nice man. And uh, he said, you know, what? I understand that this is going to be academic in nature. I don't see a problem with it because I had I had no idea. You know, I didn't know if you could just go to prison to visit or what have you. And um, he said, yeah, there shouldn't be a problem. Just make sure that you take the proper documentation when you go in. So I did that. And went in and the first time I did, you know, I uh, drove, I think, from Murray, Kentucky to Menard. Uh, came in, signed in, and then, you know, I went through this process of getting, uh, you know, searched and everything else. Who am I here to see? They take, took all the documents and stuff like that. And then uh, there was a really... Um, nice guard that actually uh during our first visit sort of transferred me from place to place and um uh, i had remember the first time i think i had to wait a few minutes because it was on a friday and there was some sort of religious services going on so i had to wait for that to clear in death row and then they finally carried me around to death row we'd stop by the uh, vending machines you know so i could buy cokes and snickers and sandwiches and stuff like that and went up there and then um we get carried, I get carried up there to the death row and I, there's this big old ledger book. It's almost like one of those old bank ledgers. And I had to sign in, say who I was going to visit. And then you would turn to the left and there was this big steel door and it had uh, uh, a long room, you know, behind it. And you could see on both sides, I think there were four visiting rooms on both sides, left and right. And in that doorway, there was this man who was yelling at the guards and cursing them out. And uh, what I realized at that point was that was John. And one of the guards says, that's who you're going to see. And he's sitting there and he's just cursing at him just because you messed up my visits. Why you take so long? And it was just vulgarity after vulgarity. Um, and then I'd go through and, you know, as soon as I walked through, they slammed the door behind you and lock it. And then I just walked down the hall and went to the door where he was at and said, hey, I'm James. And he said, hey, I'm John. He shook my hand. And then we walked into the visiting room and we sat down at this, it was almost like one of those old 70s style kitchen tables. It looks like it's got that fake Formica top with the steel legs. And he sat on one side and I sat on the other and he just had handcuffs on it. So I think some leg shackles. And I think in the, in the corner of the room, there was a fisheye camera uh, that, that probably didn't even work. Uh, and then there was an empty sort of uh, big, like canned food can that they use for an ashtray. Um, and we sat down and he had his ledger book and he had some other documents and we sat down and we just started talking about, uh, well, we got through the niceties first, you know, hey, how you doing? Did you have a good trip? Whatever and all like that. And then we basically started into the process of talking about his case. And, uh, you know, starting off, it was one of those things where he, uh, you know, talked about how much money was worth. Uh, he was the most notorious inmate in the state of Illinois. Uh, everyone wanted to visit him. You know, he, he had done this. He worked with bands. Uh, he was friends with Gigi Allen, you know, those sort of things. And then uh, just sort of chit chat. I think we talked about sports. And then uh, when it's all said and done, he started trying to bring up, uh, you know, sex and that he was bisexual and stuff like that. And I think I made the comments, well, like, you know, you, you have sex with me and I think you're homosexual. And that was something that he did not agree with. He's like, no, I'm not homosexual, I'm bisexual. And, you know, the, the day went on. It, there was so much to, that I took in that first day because of um, just the length of the visit. Because usually when I would go visit him, an hour, a visit would be six to eight hours long. It was a long visit. 
Um, and sometimes there'll be things that I'll see or smell or things like that, that will sort of trigger me back to that first visit that I had with John. Uh, but during the course of that, I think it was after lunch, we had some sort of lunch there and uh, some of the inmates on the row at the time had given up their plate so I could eat with him. Uh, and what they do is they bring two trays and I can't remember what the first meal was, but it was a lot of food. Every time we went there, there was a lot of food. I think one time when they had chicken, I think we had like six or seven pieces of chicken inside one of those styrofoam containers. And then there was some sort of vegetable, a fruit punch drink, um, some sort of sweet um, and bread of some nature. Uh, but after lunch, we started talking and then he puts his things down and um, he pulls out a pencil and uh, he had sort of started off by saying, you know, I'm the most notorious inmate in the state of Illinois, what have you. And then he goes, you see this pencil? He says, I could take this pencil and stab you in the eye before they could even get back here. You know, based on my notoriety, that's what people think I do. And I just sort of looked at him and I was just like, huh, what have I gotten myself into? And what I did at that point is I sort of followed the, uh, the research that I'd read in regard to case studies. And I got up and moved my chair right beside of him and sat down beside him and said, show me what you got. And when I did that, he stopped all that nonsense. It was sort of like I called him out. And I think that when I did that, the guards actually got up and came, unlocked the door and just walked to make sure nothing was going on. So, you know, even though I think that that lens didn't work in the corner, it worked because they got up and uh, walked down to make sure that everything was okay. And uh, after I did that, we just sort of sat and talked and he was going over the legal documents and some of the information was pretty interesting as far as the research that was done on his case. Um, and then I think uh, it was probably an hour and a half later, they said, all right, 10 minutes or what have you. Uh, I think, I can't remember if we did a Polaroid that visit or not. And then I carried, I think a painting out, a Pogo painting out or something like that. Uh, and then I may have carried something out to mail for him. And he's like, hey, uh, before I left, he says, hey, if you ever want to come back to visit, he says, you're welcome to come back after that. And I said, Sh I said, absolutely. And then I got home and sent him a letter thanking him for the visit. And basically we set up our next visit after that. So that's pretty much how the first visit went. Did he ever try to like hug you like before or after the visit or try to like be sexual or say any type of inappropriate things to you? Well, you know, during the course of the years of visiting with John for two years, you know, he would say inappropriate things from time to time. That was just his name. Well, like about yourself personally, like being that he was no, bisexual. Not really. He, he, I told him where I stood. He would just some sort of times make comments and like, you don't know what it's like until you try it and things like that. Uh, always shook my hand, you know. I think maybe the last visit I gave him a hug because I knew that that was going to be the last time I seen him. And he, you know, he came in to, to hug me too. And it was, but it was never anything like that during the time that was inappropriate. It was just sometimes the vulgarities they would go to, you know, when he was talking about uh, things sexual in nature. So during every single visit, he'd have his hands and legs shackled? Yes. Do you know if it was like that with every single visitor? It would have to be because that was the prison policy. Every visitor that came through, because I had met a couple of guys, um, you know, I met Rolando Cruz, who was on death row for a murder that and he was eventually uh, found not true that murder. Uh, what was it? Was the John Paul? I'll think of his name later. Big old guy, really nice, but everyone always had to have the handcuffs and the shackles on. Uh, there was no sort of waiver from that. There may have been one time when they came in and took something off so John could move something or sign something, um, but they were immediately put back on. That was the main thing. They always kept the cuffs on them, always. So with treading lightly here, it would have been almost impossible for him to try to kill a visitor or assault them for that matter? Uh, well, honestly, you know, when I mentioned earlier, whenever I moved that chair and you know how they kind of got up and walked, uh, the guards went through the door and walked. Um, historically speaking on any visit when there was any movement with inside the visiting room they would get up the guards would get up and sort of troll back through there and make sure everything i don't know if it was just you know intervals of checking during the course of the day but it always seemed like if somebody got up and moved around that they were going to get up and go through there so i don't know how in the world anyone could go and say that they were threatened or hurt or harmed or 
uh, sexually assaulted by John during that time, you know, and he was, he was not very well liked by the guards to begin with. And the reason I say that, uh, there, there were a couple occasions whenever, you know, at the end of the visit or, you know, a couple hours before the end of the visit, you know, you could get the Polaroids and the Polaroids were a buck a piece and the guards would come take them and then take Polaroids. And there were a couple of times when we asked for Polaroid pictures and they said they were out of film. And then you could hear some people up, two visiting rooms up from us, ask for photos. And they was like, all right, just give us a few minutes. And they would come in and take photos of them and then act as if, you know, they had, they, they just didn't want to fool with John. They would, they would tell him he, they didn't have any film, but then they would go to somebody else and take pictures for him. So he, he wasn't very well liked. And I think probably that first visit when I walked you know, through the door and he was yelling and cursing at him, I think that was probably pretty much the, the MO for him. I, did, I just don't think that they cared for him at all. Primarily probably because of his, uh, his you know, uh, criminal history probably had a lot to do with it. Right. And the only reason I asked is because, you know, obviously the, the last victim in that book was so popular in the account that Jason Moss gave. I was just curious because I know a lot of people have speculated whether or not he was handcuffed that day and if he had the opportunity to try to strangle him or molest or whatever, you know, to him. And I was just curious more than anything if, if he was ever uncuffed during any visits that you knew of. None of the visits that I ever had with him, he was always cuffed. And that was, you know, the cuffs and the little uh, uh, shackles on his feet, you know, the run around his ankles. I had never seen him when he wasn't without those. So everybody knows about his infamous artwork, um, you know, most notably Pogo and Patches. Did you guys ever speak about his artwork and, you know, like the, the meanings behind each painting and the business that he did, you know, like money figures and, you know, so on and so forth? I know he was pretty meticulous with all his stuff and kept you know, receipts, if you want to call them that, and, and what, what have you. John, a lot of times, would not go into his art. He would just talk about, you know, that his, his artistic talent was a gift from God, and uh, he would, it was more of just uh, symbolism of what he liked as far as the clowns, and he would say, you know, Pogo is a self-portrait, Patches is a self-portrait. Uh, then he started doing, you know, like the Hollywood monsters, and he would do various other criminals like Manson and uh, Zodiac, and, uh, you know, I think he did a Dahmer, he did Elvis and stuff like that. And those were his interpretations. But I think that now when you look at a Gacy painting, I think that you can see more to it, especially if you know more about the crimes, as far as like uh, a lot of times in the pogos, especially you'll see threes. And, you know, a lot of times it'll be like 33. You'll see it within the hands. You'll see that in various paintings. You'll see... Uh, you know, a lot of people think that the uh, Hi Ho series is the uh, uh, the dwarves coming out of the crawl space uh, after they helped him. You know, the digging was them digging the the trenches or the holes for the bodies. Um, he's done. A, he used to do special, you know, paintings ever series like a five hundred, a one thousand, a fifteen, a two thousand, a twenty five hundred. Those were supposed to be like big Gacy pieces. And those supposedly had hidden meaning within them. Now I've talked to guys um, who've owned paintings and uh, I was actually talking to a guy about seven or eight months ago and he had received a new painting that he had purchased, uh, you know, during the course of uh, trading other, you know, paintings. And when you looked at the painting, uh, there was a lot of, I guess, hidden meaning in it. And you could actually see it when you started focusing on it. And it was really weird to see that. And I wish at the time when I was visiting John, had we talked about that, because I think probably now uh, there was probably a lot of hidden meaning slapped into those. You know, a lot of times you'll see a lot of the 33s. If there's stars, you'll, you'll see like 33 stars or something like that, where there's, you know, multiple images. A lot of the times you need to count those to see, because it may be 33 or, you know, it may be 45, because I think when John was arrested, he says, you know, 30, 40, you know, maybe 50 people uh, I could be responsible for killing. So um, I think now we find out a lot more as far as the hidden meanings to that. But at the time, no, we really didn't talk about it. So he went from so he went from admitting guilt at first to proclaiming he was innocent up until his execution. Pretty much uh, whenever we would talk about the cases, 
he did not go into detail. I remember on the last visit, he started talking about Robert Paste uh, and talking about uh, how he killed, you know, the first, he had mentioned it during the course of the visits, talking about killing the, the, the first guy that he picked up at the bus station. That was not intentional is what he said. Uh, but most of the time, it was as if that confession statement never happened. And the sad thing about it is, while John was alive, I attempted to get a copy of the confession statement, and I couldn't get it. I, I, I was just turned down. And after he was executed, I went through, you know, the Freedom of Information Act and finally got a copy of that main confession, you know, like from the 21st to the 26th, you know, when he was talking to the Des Plaines Police Department. But yeah, generally most of the time it was just, uh, you know, he was an innocent man that someone else must have committed the crimes. And, uh, you know, he was very trustworthy and he thinks that that's what had, uh, that was the issue. Uh, then he always talked about there were 12 keys out to his house, you know, that 12 different people had it. So if they had access to his house, anybody could have put those bodies there. It was a lot of times stuff that didn't make sense. And then whenever you would ask questions about it, he always had some sort of excuse. So John was good for that. He was always good to, to sort of tell his side of it, but it wasn't, I think when you look at it from a logical standpoint, you're like, uh, this doesn't make sense. Uh, and you know, but I think that there are people out there that probably believe uh, that he didn't kill all the 33 or he killed more, uh, but I, I don't see how he could have killed that many without any sort of help, to be honest with you. I just don't see it. Yeah, I mean, I guess comparing the Houston mass murders, there were three of them and yeah. they had similar numbers. Yeah, and it was sort of similar sort of uh, young men too, when you think about it, a lot of, you know, like, uh, uh, runaways or you know kids that feel a, a certain sort of look or what have you because Dean Coral you know he he was uh he was one of those that had in mind sort of like Bundy he knew what he liked that's what he wanted when he had them pick the boys and then you know Wayne Henley was helping him and uh you know at the time I think he was giving what Wayne a couple hundred dollars for getting victims to him and unfortunately some of those victims were Wayne's friends and then, you know, David was with them as well. And I think David was sort of, I think he was probably one of those kids that was circumstanced beyond his control as well, sort of like he got caught up in it. Um, I don't know if he was one of the ones that actually brought victims to Coral like Wayne did, but uh, I think that once he was there and something happened, then he was involved. You know, it was just sort of like, now you're guilty by association, whether you want to be or not. And didn't Gacy get inspiration from Coral? Was it the torture board? Uh, that is what is said. He actually, uh, when you look at the uh, list of things that was taken from the, um, the house, you know, you'll see that there's like a two by four with hose drilled in it that sort of had handcuffs. And I think that he mentions that he he sort of got that idea from uh, Wayne Henley in uh, Houston. It should have been, he got the idea from Dean Coral. It was always Wayne Henley, Wayne Henley. But actually, as we know, Coral was the main uh, person behind those homicides. Did he ever talk about Coral in depth, like his crimes or anything? Or He just said that whenever John would talk about uh, the Houston cases, he would just talk about, you know, the sort of there was this link with this guy uh, who uh, provided a service to provide young men to people who were willing to pay and he said, you know, that this guy was involved with the uh, Houston murders and, you know, obviously it sort of spread over to Chicago and he was involved uh, similar in nature with his case. Hmm. Were you visiting him up until his execution or even uh, staying in contact with him? Yeah, we actually, my last visit with John was on April 1st of 1994. And then we had a couple of letters because uh, he was executed on May 10th of 94. So my last visit was that, and I wanted to try to get another visit in, but then it just got to the point where it's family only. Uh, and then we had a couple of phone calls. I think the last phone call was like April 17th. And then I got a letter, uh, I think I got a letter like the 28th or 29th of April. And then uh, after that, I don't recall much contact. Um, on the phone call, Prior to, I think it was our last phone call. He says, "Hey, you know, 
they're going to, looks like they're going to do this thing, meaning the execution. He's like, you know, if you want to come up, you can come up. And I, I at the time I, I told him, I said, John, I don't want to, I don't want to come and see you get executed. That's, that's not uh, something I want to see. And I, I, I don't know how that sat with him. I think I may have hurt his feelings because I didn't come up there. I'll never know. But, you know, I, I think that he, if I knew that, that he really wanted me there and wanted me to be there and uh, it was, you know, important for him to be there or Statesville to be there. Did it phase you at all when he was executed? Yeah, it bothered me. You know, after you uh, spend two years visiting somebody and uh, you develop sort of, a, I guess, a friendship, if you want to call it that, uh, it's one of those things you don't take lightly. I think that night that he was executed, I stayed up all night because it was just constant. You know, now you don't hear anything. But back in those days, you know, whenever things were going on, you would hear constants about, uh, you know, when Bundy was executed and the big, you know, the big people were executed. Uh, it was just constant 24-hour coverage. And that was something that, uh, that I dealt with. And, you know, that, that first week was was really bad afterwards. It was just like one of those things where it's almost like you go through a form of depression, even though, you know, uh, he ultimately got, you know, the penalty fit the crime, obviously. But, you know, it's just, I think it's, it, it, that happens with people. You know, if you know somebody after a while and uh, you visit with them, I think you, you develop some sort of bond or attachment with them whether you think you do or not. And I think that happens quite a bit in those sort of situations. I mean, I guess I can compare that a little bit in the sense to Philip Jablonski, but I probably, you know, wasn't as close to him as you were with Gacy in that sense. Yeah, you know, you just, uh, I, I, just, I just find it hard where if you visit somebody for two years, there's not going to be some sort of relationship. You know what I mean? And um, I guess you could say that we became friends because we talked about things other than crimes. We talked about sports. We talked about rock music. We talked about art. We talked about various things that normal people and friends would talk about. You know, it was just one of those things where uh, he was a Cubs fan. Uh, I was a Cardinals fan. So, you know, there was conflict between us on that thing. Uh, we would talk about music. We would talk about punk rock a lot. We would talk about, you know, anything, actually. He liked to talk about when he was a chef. He would talk about, you know, cooking things and what he liked to eat and just all kinds of stuff like that. Another deceased serial killer that you used to talk to was Henry Lucas. Can you basically just talk a little bit about his, his crimes in a nutshell and, you know, talk about the first time you visited him and uh, go from there. Yeah. Lucas, was, you know, was one of those killers where he was a teen killer with Otis tool. And, uh, you know, they had sort of uh, basically called cross country killers, if you will. They were teen killers that would go across the country and pretty much kill by any means uh, at their disposal. You know, they, they didn't sort of have a, go-to sort of plan you know they used guns they used knives they used their hands they used their car uh they would kill by any means necessary and they would just it was almost like there was there was nothing a lot of times that precipitated the the, the murder coming up it was just by chance that they did that and then of course when they were finally arrested i think otis was arrested first and he was arrested i think in jacksonville and this was a result of uh you know, starting fires, you know, a pyromania. And uh, then Lucas and he sort of split with their separate ways. And then Lucas um, was eventually apprehended because he killed Becky Powell. The, I think it was the niece of Otis. Uh, and, you know, <clears throat> he basically killed her and put her in a, a, a suitcase and she was found. And then he was arrested. Uh, the thing about it is when they were finally arrested, you know, they said that they had killed, you know, an ungodly amount of people, you know, seven, eight, nine hundred people. And it, when people started doing the research, they found that that wasn't the case. There was no way that they could have killed those people. Or there were actually records showing that Lucas uh, was working at the time when he said he killed somebody. And then I think one time they were asked, um, a lot of times the Texas Rangers would come in and ask them. And a lot of times, he would provide information about the case because um, they were giving him what he wanted. They were giving him cigarettes. They were giving him steaks. They were beating him. They were giving him hamburgers, what have you. 
And uh, from what I understand and what I've heard is that whenever the interviews would go south, then they would sort of, whoever was involved was sort of like uh, training back in to sort of uh, answer the way that they wanted to. Uh, like, you know, and, and I don't know, I, I wasn't there, but this is what I've heard. And I've heard this from most people is that if the, uh, if the, the victim was killed by a gun, uh, and he may say that he killed him with a knife. They go, you sure? You sure you didn't have any bullets with you? Did you use a gun? And he's, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, those sort of things. Uh, uh, but then it got to the point where it's absurd because uh, he started taking responsibility for homicides in Hawaii. And then they asked him how he got there. And he says, oh, honest, and I drove there. And they're like, all right, this guy's just, you know, starting to, to blow this out of proportion. Uh, so after that, you know, he's in prison a while. And I had actually... Uh, become friends with his, I guess, uh, girlfriend on the outside. And uh, I knew her and I actually uh, didn't realize this, but she actually grew up about 40 miles north of where I grew up when I was a kid and became friends with her. And she pretty much is the one who set up the interview. Uh, me and a couple friends from the Northeast went down there, flew into Houston and drove down uh, to Huntsville and basically set up so we could interview Henry. And that's what we did. We filmed an interview with him and it was supposed to be a probably five or six hour interview. And it actually got cut to, I think two and a half, three hours because the day that we actually visited, they had a scheduled, scheduled execution, which was very, just sort of, it was like a circus around there. There were news tr trucks from all over the country and talking about that. But that was sort of set up differently because that visit, he was on death row and the way that Texas Death Row at the time did it is they carried Lucas into sort of like a central box visiting area. And we looked through a window uh, that he was behind. He could talk to us and we were on the other side. And I don't, I don't think that because he was locked in that box, I don't think that he had handcuffs on or actually he may have had handcuffs on. It was put, put in there. And then as soon as he got in, he had to turn around and they took them off. He may have still had the leg shackles. Uh, but we basically went in and started asking Henry questions about his crimes. And we talked about his mother. And then, you know, he goes into the fact that, you know, he didn't even think that he killed his mother now. So he starts off right off the bat, start trying to do this. We started bringing up his girlfriend and uh, he wants to minimize the situation. And even though she had done a lot for him. Uh, one thing that is, is powerful about that is that during that visit with him, um, he mentioned that there was going to be a big news story about his case. And then he started going into the fact, he says, you know, I won't be here long. We're like, what? Yeah. He says, on death row, I'm like, uh, yeah, you will. You're going to be executed. He says, no. He says, you just wait. And we kept asking questions and he wouldn't go into it. And then shortly after our visit, I guess it was probably three or four months later, uh, Bush was the governor at the time. He actually commuted his sentence based on the information related to orange sauce. And I don't think they had conclusive evidence showing that Henry was the one who killed him, killed her, which was primarily the case that got him on death row. Because, you know, whenever he was making these deals, uh, I think that was the only case that stuck. You know, other than that, he would have several death penalty cases, but it wasn't. And sure enough, uh, like I said, three or four months later, I hear a news story and I was like, you've got to be kidding me. And it said, you know, Henry Lee Lucas is taken off death row and placed in general population. And then I think he was on gin pop probably for six or seven months after that. And then he ended up dying in prison from a heart attack. But I found it amazing that he, he sat there and basically told us what was going to happen with this case. And it actually happened. He was actually taken off death row. And of all people, you know, George Bush was the one that commuted his sentence. That, that right there is what blew my mind because I thought that, you know, while he was the governor at the time, Henry Lucas was going to be executed and he did not execute him or he didn't sign the death warrant. Did you guys happen to ask him about the hundreds or thousands of murders that they might have committed? Did you just ask him, is, is this bullshit or? That was one of those things where we're like, oh, come on, dude, you're, you're responsible. And, uh, but he, he did not want to go into that at all. He was, he was, you know, and I think he'd probably been coached. Uh, there were a lot of people working with him at the time and they did not want him to talk about the cases at all. I know you never visited him, but did you ever, uh, correspond with tool before he passed? 
yeah, I used to correspond with the Otis a lot. Um, um, Did he know that you visited Lucas? No, actually, uh, you know, Otis had passed away before I actually got to visit with uh. Henry. Uh, but I used to, after visiting with John, Otis was one of the first people that I corresponded with. And uh, it was so interesting to get letters from him because it was it was like a very friendly letter every time but it was so childlike uh and then you know he would talk about certain things about crimes and things about that but uh unfortunately he was just uh, i think being in prison he was taken advantage of a lot and uh the main thing that he wanted to do all the time was like try to sell art to people you know and it was just like hey could you send me five bucks and i'll send you five drawings or something like that you know it, it was just unreal at the time and as you know you know if you've got uh tool pieces now they're pretty valuable uh, yeah for more than uh five dollars or a dollar you know back then but uh, i it, it was it was one of those situations where i think Otis, as the time went on he got sicker on uh death row or not on death row, he was at start, but he was in the old population. Because what had happened at the end is Otis went from writing letters to someone else was writing the letters for him and he would just sign them. So I think, what did he die from? Uh, cirrhosis or something like that of the liver. But I think they said it may have been AIDS related or something like that. But yeah, towards the end, he was in pretty bad shape. So you recently wrote and published a textbook called Case Studies of Murder. Tell me about that textbook and what does it all entail? And is it in like universities nationwide or? Well, it, it's, um, it has the opportunity to be in universities nationwide. Um, it's uh, basically a labor of love. I was contacted by a, a publisher during the start of COVID. And I think that probably got using and, uh, that I like it. And and I, I loved the textbook at the time because it was one that I'd used for many years. Uh, the only thing that I wanted to focus on was I started to want to sort of focus on crimes that were closer to Alabama. And then I wanted to do it as a um, qualitative study where it's case studies in nature, you know, and basically the life history of the people. And they said, you know, this sounds like a great idea. So, uh, I went for it and basically spent time working on this book and it covers, you know, David Gore, Fred Waterfield, Larry Bittercore, Roy Norris, of course, uh, uh, BTK. Uh, I talk about hybristophilia and groupies. Um, who else? I've got Todd Colehep, a uh, chapter on Colehep. I got BTK. I've got Gacy. Uh, um, I talk about Lucas, uh, Ramirez, Bundy, and the bunch as far as groupies and the hybristophilia. Uh, it was basically a 10 chapter book. And what I did was I just wanted something that um, whenever I teach, what I do is uh, my teaching method is more like a storyteller. And what I do is I tell you the story of the individual we're going to talk about. And uh, I think that that sort of sticks with students more the way that I teach as far as, you know, telling them the historical narrative of it. And sort of the thing about it is I have um, so many situations where I'm aware of this person through correspondence that I can tell them situations that I was in with this person and talk about like the correspondence and stuff like that, especially when it came to David Gore. Uh, then, you know, I also covered uh, Daniel Siebert uh, and he was a local boy and then even Jack Trawick. And, you know, a lot of times you don't hear a lot of uh, stories or information about those sort of killers. So it was an opportunity for me to sort of do a book of offenders that I was interested in that were local as well and um, just give the, the students a broad sort of uh, spectrum of what these killers did instead of that little paragraph that you see whenever you pick up a book and I'd like mention them for two seconds and then move on. And I, and I didn't want to do that. I want to sort of let them have the, the narrative, whether it was good or bad and talk about the crimes and talk about how they did it and go into the type of killers and what have you. And, it, and this, this uh, 
last time it was first time I used it. I'll use it again next semester, but we're going to be online class. But the first time I used it in the classroom, it went over pretty well when we were back in the traditional classroom. You have one chapter that covers murder of Bilia, which I'd briefly like to touch on uh, before we wrap this interview up. Sure. So would this be a fair statement that murder of Bilia originated in the 1970s or early 1980s, like mainstream murder of Bilia? I would say that's correct. Um, you know, you, 70s we're talking about the late 70s uh but you know um in the 80s the pieces sort of started like seeping out and i don't think we referred to it at that time as murder being at the time uh you know that's when john was putting out paintings or you would see people who were sort of there were a lot of people believe it or not that were, were corresponding with killers at that time nobody knew about it um and then the 80s you know uh gacy's sort of painting started picking up charlie was doing uh his scorpion art he was doing paintings uh, and, uh, you know, signing photos. Uh, and then when you get to sort of like the 90s, you got the serial killer craze or the pandemic, and you got Bitterker doing greeting cards, and you got uh, Bianchi doing art, you got Norris sort of like dabbling with art, Charlie still doing his art. Um, everybody seemed to be doing something. Uh, and uh, a lot of times that the murder of Bia sort of gets taken out of context, I think, because a lot of people think that murder of Bia specifically relates to the victims, and it doesn't. Uh, a lot of times it's just, in a sense, a piece of paper, a photo, or a memento from a serial killer that they owned. Uh, and that's why I get that a lot of infringing upon some of the same laws. And I have to explain that a lot of times to students is like, well, really, the piece that you see doesn't relate to the crimes in any matter. And I think that, you know, historically speaking across the United States, we've seen that, that courts have ruled that, you know, this doesn't fall under the Son of Sam laws because it isn't related to the crime. Now, there have been a few pieces that come out, you know, and, and I've seen a couple of those before. And, uh, you know, what, what you see today is now a lot of prison uh, a lot of prisons, what they do is they even stop inmates from sending art out, which it could be just a gift because, you know, a lot of these places still have these prison gift shops where you can go in and buy a piece from a notorious inmate and not even know it. Uh, I think years ago, I was told that you used to be able to buy uh, Manson art or scorpions in the uh, gift shop. Yeah, you, you still know, can. At, well, at, at San Quentin, the last time I was there, I bought a Charles Ng um, origami and a few paintings from a few different random serial killers. You just have to know their numbers by heart because they don't they don't sign their first and last names for that reason, I guess. <laughs> Probably so. Years ago, it's one of those things. But you got to know the inmate number, like I said. Uh, but, you know, I guess if they're in the gift shop, it's okay. But, you know, when they're sending them out, a lot of times I think now, uh, and it may be because some somebody sort of like publicizes and it may look the prison look bad i think that's what we're looking at now uh, but the the murder billion in a sense has been around for many years uh it's uh it's a lot of it's a historical documents and people you know don't want to see it that way but um a serial killer is a historical figure in a sense and uh it's just like uh, war criminals and what have you. They're historical figures, mafia related. It all falls within the same gamut. I think though, what we find with the serial killers is it seems like they tend to be more graphic in a sense in the release of their art or the crafts that they release. And I think when they do that, it sort of brings attention to it or whenever they sort of get vocal and brag about the stuff they do. And I think that that's when you run into issues with it, especially whenever you got victims' families still suffering and they haven't received any compensation for something that had 15, 20, 30 years ago. And they feel, I can understand completely where they come from. They feel that it's not right for an inmate to be receiving funds uh, just based on their name alone because of the notoriety. And they're not being sent to some sort of crime victims fund or chapter or what have you. And the crazy thing is, is even in recent times, even with Son of Sam laws, there's not a whole lot that they can do. Like, for instance, Sam Little, he was painting his portraits of his victims and selling it and openly communicating in the mail about it. And 
he was making hundreds, if not thousands of dollars a month painting his, the victims that he strangled and was bragging about. And it's like, either they don't care or they can't do anything, you know, and it's, it's to the point where it's, honestly, I, I think it's become mainstream enough to where some people just might not care or they look at it, you know, as, as like artifacts of history and, you know, it is what it is. And, yeah, you know, I mean, there's I, museums that display Nazi memorabilia and. Yeah, and I think that that's probably where uh, sometimes people don't want to, to, to look at that because the Holocaust is obviously a whole lot more horrible than, than what we're talking about these guys, but uh, the, those war criminals were just as bad and horrible, you know. Um, speaking to Sam, I actually wrote to Sam uh, and he responded to me a couple of times and I was like, hey, I'm interested in your art. And then he wrote me a letter back and it was all choppy and you really couldn't understand it. And then he sent another letter and then I remember I was sitting watching, I would assume at the time it was probably COVID related based on his age and, you know, it was during that COVID scare early on and uh, went to the post office and I come out and I, I look, open up my mailbox and there's actually a manila envelope and I take it and I, I just take it in the car and put it in the car and my wife sees it and she goes, that guy just died. I said, yeah, I know. And we got home and uh, it was actually uh, a victim painting they sent me and all it had was the thing in there no letter or anything else and it was sent and he probably it was probably one of the last pieces that he mailed out before he died hmm. uh but i've got the postmark envelope and everything and it was like one of the last pieces he did yeah sam little was was a trip we were supposed to do an interview and we arranged it and everything and he just never called me back he had some woman that he said was his agent and everything had to go through her art requests and everything. And <laughs> so that never, that never came about, but um, definitely, you know, interesting to speak to him before he passed away. Um, so before we wrap this interview up, is there anything that you'd like to add that we haven't covered yet? I will say that um, one thing that I was impressed with, and I think that this is probably from just a, um, from the, the, you know, uh, a forbidden truth standpoint. Um, and let me say this, you didn't ask me to say this, but I think people, if they're interested in these cases, I really think that they need to take the time and probably go back and revisit your podcast with Todd Kohep, because I think that is probably one of the best podcasts that I have ever listened to in related in relation to true crime. It was unbelievable the way he opens up. And I think that if anyone has any interest in serial murder and serial killers, I think that would be the one to listen to because it's no holds barred. He opens up and he talks about it uh, and the cockiness and sort of like just the attitude will sort of give you that sociopathic behavior sort of idea that people who may not be aware of it, if they listen to it, they can see sort of, uh, in a sense, patient zero serial killer. You know what I mean? Uh, and I think that that I, I mentioned that quite a bit to people whenever they ask about podcasts. I was like, if you want to, if you want to hear one, uh, and you've got, I know you've got tons of them out there. I said, but there is one podcast with one specific killer that I believe everybody should listen to. And I know it's pretty lengthy. And that's the other thing that I enjoyed about that is because I finally got, there was some meat there. You know what I'm talking about on the bone? And you were able to go through and ask him questions and and I noticed a lot of times it was, uh, he just took over and you didn't have the opportunity to, to speak a lot. But I think that that is the perfect example of a true serial killer. You know, the great thing about Todd in the sense of interview form is with other serial killers I've interviewed, none of them are, I won't say as, as interesting as him, but not as, you know, articulate and willing to go into depth and willing to admit guilt like he is, you know, he, he doesn't care to talk about each individual homicide as where a lot of serial killers just don't want to get into it or they feel like they're reliving it like dirty or just weird or but Todd has no problem with it and I feel like I like you said I got the meat of everything because he said literally nothing was off limits so said okay we'll, we'll hit every single question even if it's the the smallest thing because you know why not I mean I have access to a you know fairly high profile serial killer I'm going to pick them apart, you know, as I, as I choose or so to say. Well, you know, I think that with that being said, I think that if they listen to that one, then they need to go and listen to, uh, you know, the, uh, the widow of, uh, the victim with the bike. Oh, um, Melissa shot. Brackman Ponder. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. That sort, of, that sort of like ties it up and sort of gives you a really good understanding of everything. 
And uh, if anything, it sort of shows you the most powerful and impactful thing that I got from her podcast after listening to the long one is uh, it's the true, I guess, uh, story of forgiveness. And uh, just imagine after all she and had to deal with, and I was just like, what an amazing moment. I was like, uh, Todd should be thankful uh, that uh, she hasn't uh, just caused more problems because she could. And I'm surprised that more people, after they heard that podcast, had to cause problems for him because he opened himself up. He really did. But, you know, it's one of those podcasts where you never hear that much information about a killer. Because, you know, you weren't going to hear that, uh, say, if you, you talk to uh, some of the more well-knowns, uh, they're just not going to talk about it. The, the only exception, maybe, is if David Gore was still alive, David Gore would probably give Cohep a run for his money. Uh, but, you know, it... That podcast shows the true sociopathic nature of a serial killer. And, you know, I recommend it to anyone to listen to. The thing about Todd is he actually did get in trouble, believe it or not. I don't know if he still is now, but he lost his phone privileges. They froze his account because there was a guy that I guess Todd had written a book with and Todd sent the book to. And I guess the guy had screwed him over. And I guess Todd swears up and down that this guy called the prison and said that he did this interview with me on a cell phone, which he did not, you know, I, I was paying for the phone calls and everything. And I don't know if he still can now, but I haven't heard from Todd, you know, in probably six or so months. And he hasn't called me since our last interview it was like almost two years ago or now or so. So he did get in pretty big trouble, but at the same time, he, he wanted to speak and he enjoyed speaking. And I feel like I, I got a lot of, a lot of juicy, you know, details that might not possibly ever be, you know, possible again, being that the administration is, you know, on him even more now. Uh, yeah, it was, it was, and, and let me sort of circle back around real quick. You know, I, there's something that I do want to mention, and I talk to this a lot as far as my students are concerned, and I sort of did an intro of the textbook about this, but I also do this every class, and I also do it as the intro and sort of outro. I was like, you know, um, you never know. I'm not possibly ever be, you, haven't met you know, possible by, again, you know, being that the administration is, you know, on him even more now. Uh, uh, yeah, it was, and I always tell, and, and, and let me sort of circle back around with this, you know, I, there's something that I do, and, and, and I talk to this a lot as far as my students are concerned, and I sort of did an intro, don't say just about this, but I also do this every class, and I also do it as the intro and sort of outro. Be aware of your surroundings, you know. Uh, if you're if you're on campus, you, you walk never know campus at night. when it comes make to sure you your keys. If you have it or you've got one, the just uh, by the freeze plus P in your hand, uh, make sure that you you know got a phone with you and keep your phone in your hand as well and walk in lighted areas because uh, you never know. And I always talk about safety because that is a main thing, you know. Because we talk about Jack Trawick and Jack Trawick used to drive around the campus that I teach on looking for, oh, for wow. victims. So. Uh, uh, I just want to close with that as like, you know, make sure you're aware of your surroundings and be careful when you're out and about because you never know what could happen to you, especially in this day and age. That was my interview with James Sparks. Be sure to head on over to UnforbiddenTruth.com to keep up to date on everything Unforbidden Truth related. Thank you for listening. Unforbidden Truth. I'm, 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 I'm,